So we want to stay close to the word, and uh, we want to uh, lead our lives in such a way as they meet God's approval, and we want to go, we want to live according to God's word, according, according to God's word. The Bible says, his word is like a lamp to our feet. It shows, throws light on our path and shows us how we need to walk. A lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Amen. Thank God for the illumination that comes to us from God's word. Please turn with me this morning to the book of Romans. And the Lord has uh, caused me to focus on two verses in that chapter, Romans 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. And the Lord has had me to focus on two verses there. And he's gripped me with, those, with the contents of those two verses. And uh, there's so much there in those two verses. Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2. And uh, we'll hope to uh, uh, amplify that with you as the Spirit would enable us this morning. Father God, I pray that you will help us. O oh Lord, to receive from your word the message that you intended, Lord, when these words were written. Lord, we just open up our hearts, O oh God, to your word this morning. We pray, O oh Lord, that your word will bless us and it will transform our lives. It will make an impact on our lives, O oh God. Lord, your word does so much for us, and we thank you for this word that's been preserved and that is now available to all people everywhere. We realize, Lord, that it wasn't always this way, that there was a time when the word was removed from the hands of the people. But we are thankful, Lord, that we have the Bible and that we have your word. Help us today to speak it and to hear it in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We want to look at the various words in this, this passage this morning and some of the phrases so that there may be an impartation to our lives, a gripping of our lives. That is what we would hope for the most, is a gripping of our lives. That means the apprehension of the Lord. We all need that constant apprehension, the hand of God upon us that will not let us go our own way. The problem with sin is this, that it drives us to go our own stubborn way, a way that seems best to us, but is so, so much contrary to the way of God. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Isaiah said, we all, as he pondered and as by the Spirit he was made to see the human predicament. He said, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. And Peter adds, after the coming of Jesus and this wonderful plan of redemption is revealed, Peter adds, but we're now returned to the bishop and shepherd 
of our souls. Praise God. That's salvation. Amen. When our lives are apprehended of the Lord, and now we have a new direction. Glory to God. Aren't you glad you have a new direction? You don't walk in darkness or in the stubbornness of your own way, but you are now, your heart has been captivated. You have surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus, and you say, Jesus, have your way in my life. Your way. I want to know what your way is. I'm open. God, give us a teachable spirit. A teachable spirit. That we can sit down and and be taught by the word of God. There was a house that Jesus liked to visit a lot. And that was the house of of, uh, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were his friends. He frequented that house a lot. He liked to go there. And I think one of the reasons why he liked to go there is because they received him so warmly and so openly, especially Mary, who as soon as he would come in the house, he would say, sit down here, Lord, and she would come and sit at his feet and be ready to hear the word out of his mouth. That so pleased him. (laughs) And God always just appreciates and loves those who love his word, and who are teachable, and who want to learn. May God give us a teachable spirit. Hallelujah. So there are words and phrases here this morning which I feel the Holy Spirit would expound upon. And first of all is the word therefore. I beseech you, therefore. Now therefore would, is a word that re- would refer you to what has already been spoken. And we could say this, I beseech you in view of this. I beseech you because of what has been spoken in the previous passage. I beseech you therefore, or because of this. Well, why are you beseeching you, beseeching us, Lord? Well, we look into the previous chapter. And in the previous chapter, It's really mostly about natural Israel and the awesome things that God had for them. But in that chapter is also the knowledge that you and I were brought into the things that God had for the nation of Israel. Let's look at it briefly. Turn in your Bibles. In uh, uh, verse, um, let's see, in Romans chapter 11, and uh, let's read from verses 20. And to 24, he says, uh, well, he says, that's well, that's all well and good. Because of unbelief, they, that is Israel, were broken off of this, of this olive tree. And thou standest by faith. We stand today by faith. Thank God for the gift of faith that God has given us. We are saved by grace and that through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. God wants to restore the fear of God to his people. But fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, that is Israel, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So you and I as Christians should not walk in pride and cockiness and say, well, we have it made because we're religious or we have it made because we're saved. No, he says, be careful. Walk softly and tenderly because there's also the possibility that you and I could also be broken off or uh, fall short. Verse 22, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. There's a balance. Behold, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. Thank God for his goodness. His goodness as revealed in sending his son, Jesus. But toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. We need to continue in his goodness. Otherwise, 
thou also shalt be cut off. See, that helps us to walk in the fear of the Lord when we realize there is a chance that you and I could, could be cut off from his high and glorious purposes. And when you hear a testimony like the president of the National Association of Evangelicals falling into sin and practicing sin for a number of years, and suddenly he's cut off. It could happen to me. It could happen to any preacher. It could happen to any of you. So we need to walk softly and in the fear of God. The, Bible, the Bible's way uh, that is taught us of walking in the Christian walk is, take heed, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. That's the tone that should prevail in our hearts. Not cockiness, not ban banking ourselves on one experience we had, but walking daily in the fear of the Lord. Continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. Israel has an opportunity to come in if they believe in Jesus Christ. For God is able to graft them in again. He's talking about this tree, this olive tree. You'll, you'll find it. Here it, is, here it comes in verse 24. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, that is the Gentiles, uh, the, the Gentile practices, the Gentile religions and all of that, if you were cut out of that and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Let's go back at verse 17 here, which I also want to bring in there. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them... And with them, and with them, partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Now you see, here is a picture that we have to, uh, we have to uh, accept. Uh, we have to accept it because it's right here in the Word of God. And the picture is this, that here is a tree growing. The whole house of Israel is, is likened unto an olive tree here. And this olive tree has its roots in Christ. For Christ was in the Old Testament. They ate of the bread. They, they, they drank of the water that followed them. Christ was in the Old Testament. And all that was purposed in Israel had its roots in Jesus Christ. For all the while, both in Israel and in the church, God is working out a supreme and awesome purpose. It's called the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, this is what we're seeing here, what, this is what we're hearing. You came out of a wild olive tree, and now, through the mercy of God, through the mercy of God and the grace of God, by the experience of salvation, you're grafted in. My father used to do this. He used to take a, a branch out of a, a certain kind of a fruit tree that wasn't doing so well, and he'd put it into another uh, fruit tree that was doing a lot better. And uh, with careful, it was a careful process, bandage it all up and just put it in the right place and cut it just the way it ought to be cut. And I would see this limb starting to grow. They used to do that a lot in Italy. Grafting, grafting of a branch cutting it from one tree and putting it into another tree. So let's be clear that that's what happened in salvation. You were grafted in to the natural olive tree, which was the house of Israel. Now that may sound strange to some of you, but let's hear the word of God. The word of God says you and I were grafted in because of our faith in Christ Jesus. And uh, this should become to us, beloved, an awesome revelation. 
an awesome revelation. Those of us who know the Bible, the Old Testament story, you know that this natural olive tree <clears throat> came out of the roots of Christ's faith as it was manifested and it, as it was walked out in the life of our father Abraham. Abraham, folks, is our father, not just the father of the Jews. He's our father. Why? Because he's the father of faith. He's the father of all the faithful. Abraham is our father because of his faith in God. And as we pursue this a little bit, we find <clears throat> <clears throat> that God made a covenant with Abraham. Let's just follow me a little bit here. And this, this will hopefully, <clears throat> excuse me, bring more meaning to Romans 12, 1 and 2. God got a hold of this man, Abraham, when he was a heathen, a pagan, in a place called Ur of the Chaldees. And all of a sudden, the God, he had a vision. His room was filled with light and glory. And the God of glory appeared and he said, Abraham, get thee out of this country and out of your father's house and follow me to a place that I have for you. And I'll show you where to go. For in blessing, I will bless you. And I will make of you a great nation. And you will become a father of many nations. And, watch this, through you and your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That was the covenant. That was the covenant that God made with Abraham. Through you and your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now turn with me, hold your finger in Romans 12 and, hold, and turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Now this is going to be a combination of preaching and teaching this morning, but it's for a purpose. Glory be to God. I hope that you like to get into the word a little bit <clears throat> and see things in his word. I don't have time to read the entire context, but in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, there's two powerful verses in verse 16 and 29. Let's just first read, read 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is, everybody say it, is the seed Christ? Through you and your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And the seed is Christ. Oh, there was Isaac, there were descendants, but that was all a natural fulfillment just actually to show us the pattern and show us the way. So the seed is Christ. Now look again in verse 29 of this same chapter. Praise the Lord. Those who have the King James Version, read it with me out loud. Ready? And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, my goodness, is that really true? <laughs> well, it's got to be true if it's in the Bible. Somebody was telling me, uh, who was it was telling me about this? Uh, uh, he was having a discussion with a Baptist uh, person, and they were discussing some topic. And... Uh, 
And, he, and the, the person thought, well, I, I sure, after quoting a number of scriptures, he said, I surely have this man convinced. Then all of a sudden he says, well, if you go only by the Bible, well, what else can you go by? What else should you go by? Well, if you go only by the Bible, yeah, but, 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 but. And we have a way of injecting and bringing in what my denomination teaches and, and what I read and what I think and all that. But no, let us go only by the Bible. Can you say amen? Let's go by the Bible. In a day when you have so much deviation, so many religions, never, there are 290 some Protestant denominations alone. How shameful. Why? Because there's a departure from the Bible. We want to return to the Bible. And so the Bible says, the Bible says that Christ was Abraham's seed. It would be in Christ that the ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant would take place. And you and I, because of our faith in Christ, because we are Christ, we are brought into the outworking of this awesome covenant. And that is the setting there that causes such a strong passage to come out as what we see in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, in other words, because you're called to be a part of the Abrahamic covenant, I beseech you, because you've been grafted into such an awesome purpose, I beseech you, and the word beseech means, I implore you. Oh, I charge you. I yearn after you. The word beseech means, come near. Draw nigh. Enter in. I beseech you. I implore you. Uh, we could almost say, I beg you. I beg of you. I beg of you. Therefore, I beg of you in view of this. And God hit me afresh with just those words. I beseech you. It's not just something, well, well now, if you, if, you, if you want to, uh, if you would like to, uh, uh, if you think it's okay, you can do it. No, I beseech you. Hallelujah. I beseech you, God is, is coming after us in this passage. I beseech you because of your calling into Abraham's covenant. Because of the awesome purpose that rests on your life. What are you doing with your life? What are we doing with our time? Our strength our energy, our money, in view of the awesome calling. I beseech you, by the mercies of God, and thank God we have a merciful God. Well, what is it you beseech us about? I beseech you that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That I beseech you that you present, present, that you, let's put it in very easy words, that you bring your bodies to the altar, to God's altar, which can be this altar or can be a spiritual altar that you create and establish in your heart. That you present it, that you have a transaction with the Lord. an interaction with your God. As God is saying, I want all of your life. A living sacrifice. And the reference there is, beloved, to the burnt offering of the Old Testament. The whole burnt offering. 
There were a number of offerings in the Old Testament, but the first one that's described in Leviticus chapter 1 is the burnt offering. The other offerings, in the other offerings, trespass offering, sin offering, peace offering, thanksgiving offering, the high priest could go in there with his fork and pull out certain parts of the offering and uh, give it to the priest because they had to have a way of eating and, and uh, maintaining life. And so the priest got a portion of some of the offerings. But not so with the whole burnt offering. The whole burnt offering was put in, on the altar. And the offerer said in his heart, and he said to the priest, this is a whole burnt offering. Put the fire under it and let it be consumed totally as a sweet fragrance for the Lord. That's what God is beseeching us for in Romans 1, 12, 1. I beseech you that you present your body a whole burnt offering. That your life would be consumed for God. Not for a whole lot of other frivolous pursuits. I know we have to work. I know we have to tend to our families. I know we have this and that and the other, which are legitimate responsibilities. But there's so many things that are frivolous, ridiculous. And we get preoccupied. And we just pour our time, our energy, our money into frivolous things that are unacceptable. And God says, come, you've got an awesome calling on your life. I beseech you that you present your bodies. Your bodies, that doesn't mean just physical. The word bodies there in the, in the Greek means all of you. All of you. Your spirit, your soul, and your body to the Lord. All of you. This is a hard message this morning. It should hit us down deep in every aspect of our makeup. Turn with me in the Bible to a passage that I feel that would fit in here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Please stay with me. These are awesome days. Folks, listen, the world is in a critical situation. The church is tottering. Will it exist in a manner that is acceptable to God, or will God spew it out of his mouth? This is a question, a legitimate question today. What will God do with the church? God's looking for a remnant. He's looking for a people who will mean business with him, that will transact meaningful business with God that will impact our lives for a long, long time to come. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Just going to read excerpts from it here, verse 13. Meats for the belly. Well, let's look at verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. You see how how dedicated and committed Paul is here to the high calling. He says, I don't want to miss this high calling. And I walk very, very carefully. I will not allow anything to govern my life other than Jesus Christ. I won't allow my carnal nature to have dominion over me, the lust of the flesh. I won't allow the lust of the eyes to, to have the, the dominion over me. I won't enter into the world's pride of life. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Master. And I walk carefully. I am so dedicated to him, he said, and in this he outshines us all. 
He says, I'm so dedicated, he says, that I, I have laid aside the privilege of even having a wife. And I do that for the sake of the kingdom of God. What price do we pay? What will we do for the, for the cause? For the sake of establishing this covenant and making it a reality that through us, the church, and saved individuals, that many lives could be touched. We are called to be a blessing. We are called to manifest Christ. What will we do? What will we do with all the things that God has given us? The life that he gave us at birth, the spirit. That little baby, when it cries in the in the time of birthing, it receives the Spirit of God. The bodies that we have that are healthy, the mind that can, can think clearly yet. Here's what the Bible says, verse 13, meats for the belly and belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. Would all of you repeat after me this phrase today, my body is for the Lord right now. My body is for the Lord. Let's do it again. My body is for the Lord. Hallelujah. Not for fornication. And we're going to start mentioning this over and over again because repeatedly we hear of ministers falling into adultery, fornication. Sexual perversion is rampant today all over the world. Illegitimate things in the realm of sex. And sex, illegitimate sex, destroys more lives today than I think ever before, at least in my lifetime. But we need to know that our body is not for fornication, but it's for the Lord. Verse 15, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. Verse 18, flee fornication. Run away from it. As soon as temptation presents itself, run the other way like Joseph did in the Bible. Run the other way. Run away from Potiphar's wife. Don't linger around it. Folks, as your pastor, I need to say to you, you need to be careful of the type of television programs that you watch. Because there are so many that feed your lower nature and cause it to rise up. I, I'm telling you, you need to do that. And you, you can't take that position that, I'm a Christian, I'm strong, I would never do any of that, so I can watch it and it won't harm me. That is not the truth. Every foul, filthy, unclean thing that you watch with your eyes brings a deposit into your spirit. And it has an impact. It does something to your nature. It will grieve the Holy Ghost, first of all, that's in you. And if you allow this practice to go on, there was a, pardon, well, I shouldn't say pardon me, this is the Holy Spirit this morning. There was a meeting of the promise keepers several years ago. And God started talking to the men about pornography. And an altar call was given. And more than 50% of the men came to the altar confessing that they had been involved in pornography and they needed deliverance. Folks, these, these things are very real today and we need to keep ourselves holy. Holy. Because he's going to have a holy church. Verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 6. What? What? He's saying, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you which you have of God, and ye are not your own. For you are bought with a price. 
Oh, think of Jesus on the cross momentarily. The blood that is shed was shed by him to purchase you. Listen, folks, not only that you would have eternal life when you die, but so that, so that he could have your life now to serve him and to glorify him between now and the time you die. <laughs> Does that make sense? You're not your own. You, you and I don't have the liberty, should not have the liberty, to do what we want to do with ourselves. Know ye not that you're not your own? You're bought with a price. Somebody else owns you. That's the meaning of the word Lord. It means proprietor. He's the owner. Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. He owns me. He has the right to my mind, my soul, my heart, my spirit, my body. They're all his. And I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to lay all these things at the altar and to present them to the Lord and say, Lord, I am totally yours. Praise God. This is a serious message. All of your bodies, all of you, no reservation. A living sacrifice. Let's turn back to Romans again. Oh, God, lay hold of us this morning. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. God wants us to be a holy people. Holiness, the preaching of holiness has become old-fashioned. The majority of preaching today majors on how he can, God can bless you, how you can get rich. Sow your seed and you'll get a harvest. The cross is hardly mentioned. Holiness is seldom heard. But he says, the Lord says, I want your life, I want all of you, and I desire that it be holy. All of the law of the Old Testament was for one purpose, that it would produce a holy people. The law can be summed up in one phrase, be ye holy, even as I am holy. But you say that was Old, Old Testament. No, I refer you to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. It says exactly the same thing. Be ye holy, even as I am holy. What does it mean? separated totally unto God. Holiness means separation. I belong to you, Lord. Here's my life. I'm, I'm aware that I'm not to live my life like the ordinary individuals, individual in this world. I'm to be separate from a lot of things. I'm to be separate from sin, from the temptations of the devil, I'm to be separate from this world. Remember Samson? Remember his long hair? Delilah kept after him. And there's a Delilah that will be after you all the days of your life. Because the devil doesn't like a consecrated person. Someone who really means business. Someone who says, I'm going to live for God. I'm not going to follow the way of the worldling. There's a Delilah that will keep after you. Tell me your secret. And finally, he gave in and said, if my hair is cut, I'll be just like every other man. That's what the devil wants. He wants all the human race to be the same, just eating, drinking, making merry, sleeping, having a good time, ignorant, walking in darkness, ignorant of the high calling of God in their life. 
The devil wants to reduce, reduce you to the life of an animal. Just eat, drink, lay down on your pen, scratch the sides of the house once in a while for entertainment. We turn the boob tube on. <laughs> no, no real purpose. Eat, drink, sleep. Once in a while, run around the ends of the chain. And wear that path out. Doing the same things all over again. That's how Samson ended up. After his consecration had been tampered with. He wound up with a, a rope around his waist. Grinding with the grindstone. Grinding wheat with the grindstone. And he would round and round. Round and round. That was the job of a donkey. But now Samson was doing it. Round and round and round. Lost to God's awesome purpose. A meaningless, relatively meaningless lifestyle. What does this amount to in comparison with what you were doing, Samson? And that's what the devil would reduce us to. Just meaningless, a meaningless form. Eating, drinking, mending our house, fixing our car, this and that, the natural life, ignorant of this awesome calling. And so God says, don't you know that you're attached to this awesome covenant? I beseech you. Therefore, present your bodies holy, separated. Lord, I'm going to give myself to this all the days of my life. Those that were called to a special purpose in the Old Testament were called Nazarites. Their lifestyle was even more narrow than even that of the priests. Narrow. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. It's not broad. And there be few that go that way. But we look at the world. Oh, look at what, what they're doing. Wow. They're having a great time. It has been said, and rightly so, that sin thrills before it kills. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Does God accept your life the way you're living it right now? I appeal to your conscience. Is there any conviction? Is there any, is there, might there be a need for some changes or some adjustments? To what degree have you carried your holiness, your separation to God? To what degree? Can you, could you go a step further today? Would there be a chance that God might be speaking through Brother Valori today and beckoning you to a higher level of holiness? Further separation. Lord God, I want to give, I'm going to give more time to you. I I'm going to meditate on this calling. I'm going to search the scriptures out. I want to see what's involved with it. What am I to do? What am I to be? I want to seek these scriptures. I want to soak myself in the word of God. I don't want to miss the high calling. Paul said, I bring my body under subjection lest having pre been preached to others, I myself would become a castaway. A castaway. Not from heaven, but from his high purposes. Acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You say, I want to serve God. I want to go on the mission field.
The word reasonable there should be translated spiritual. The most spiritual thing you can do is to present yourself to God, to bring yourself to an altar, and to say, Lord, I am yours. Totally yours. Lord, today, I give up the right to myself. And I acknowledge that you have the right to myself. I really don't. You have a right to my time and my strength. All these years that you're giving me, you have a right to have them and to use them for your glory. I don't have the right to do with them what I want to do. That is the most spiritual service that you can make to God. That's the highest spiritual activity you could ever be involved with is to present yourself to an altar and say, Lord, here I am. Because when God wants to accomplish his work, he looks, he goes to the altar and he sees who's there. And if you're not there, he won't take you. How can he? You're not there. He goes and he takes those that are totally committed and surrendered to him. God looks at the altar. And he takes people from the altar. Not those that are out there wishy-washy and wanting to have place many, certain demands uh, on God and say, well, I'll serve you, God, if. <clears throat> if you do this and you promise this and, and, and if my response means this and it doesn't mean that, then I'll, I'll surrender. No. God doesn't, he's not interested in that kind of a person. He's interested in that person who has come to the altar. And when I say come to the altar, I mean transacted something in the depth of your heart with God. Where you have said, Lord, I want to be totally yours. I want you to take control of my life. I want you to have my spirit, my soul, my mind, my heart, my body, my talents, my ability. Everything, Lord, is yours. Lord, I now understand this great plan of salvation that God, Father God, you sent Jesus, your son, to purchase me, to buy me, so that I would belong to you all the days of my life. Not to live aimlessly and come to the end and, and to come to age 70 or 75 and wonder, what have I done with all my life? Because folks, listen, temporal things all pass away. You give yourself to temporal things, whew, they go. They dissipate. There's no eternal value. Let's finish this. <clears throat> and be not conformed to this world. Let's translate that. Don't let the world put you into its mold. Don't you get your eyes on people who are advancing in this world, seemingly advancing, seemingly successful. Don't pay any attention to the world's standard. It is diametrically opposed to God's standard. We don't want to climb the ladder of corporate success. 
We don't want to be somebody in this world because in the realm of the church, we're all a bunch of nobodies. The weak things, the base things, the things that don't amount to anything, those are the ones that God chooses to do a mighty work. King James puts it to confound the things that are mighty. Another translation would be like this. Don't take the pattern of the world. Don't accept the pattern of the world. Don't let the world put you into its mold. There's a mold. You know, things, a lot of things can be made out of a mold. You pour stuff into it. It hardens, and then you have something. Don't let the world pour you in to its mold. Don't yield and yield and yield and yield until the the world has its mold around you and you turn out a worldling. Don't allow that. But rather than that, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What an awesome opportunity you have this morning by attending this service. You are being transformed. The word transformed comes from the Greek word, listen to this. The word transformed comes from the Greek word metamorpho. The process of metamorphosis. And you've all heard the same, the, the example many times as I have heard it, the caterpillar that climbs up a little bush finds a certain place there where a certain branch comes out and he starts, he lodges there and he starts spitting out stuff and wraps it around him and builds a cocoon. And then he lives in that cocoon for a while. And there's an awesome, mysterious, and yet very wonderful process takes place. And that caterpillar is changed, transformed. Metam- he un- undergoes a metamorphosis, and he changes into a butterfly. <laughs> Glory to God. And when he's fully developed, he'll start tearing the cocoon apart at the one end. He'll tear it apart and then there'll there'll be an opening there and out he comes. Not crawling around along the ground, but in a new environment, flying through the air. Be not conformed, but be transformed. Hallelujah. Transformed. Do you know where, it's cha- where this word is used? It's used of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Where it says, you know, he took Peter, James, and John with him up to this high mountain. And all of a sudden, the glory of God overshadowed this whole place. And Jesus, they looked at him, they looked on him, they looked on him. And his face began to shine. More and more and more and more. He took on, and Peter, in recalling this, says, I remember what happened. God the Father gave him honor and glory. Jesus took on the glory of God. A man of flesh and blood took on the glory of God. You and I can take on the glory of God as we behold him. The same word is used in 2 Corinthians 3.18 but we are changed from glory to glory as beholding him. We are changed into the same image. The word change is the same as the word transformed in Romans 12, 2, and is the same as the word transfigured in Matthew 17. Transfigured, transformed, changed. Glory to God. Don't allow the world to put you into its mold, but be transformed, changed 
Get into his word. Come to church. The word of God is a transforming word. The presence of God will change you. Hallelujah. Be transformed by <clears throat> the renewing of your mind. One man has said, you are what you think. And the Bible confirms it. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So this process of regeneration starts with the renewing of our mind. Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. Jesus worked with his disciples for three years, and finally he said, now you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you. <clears throat> Outside of Christ, we, our mind is all cluttered up with the ways of the world, the methods of the world, the thoughts of the world, even religious things that have to go. And the Bible says that Jesus is working on the church. <clears throat> Jesus is working on the church. And this work is described in Ephesians <clears throat> chapter 5, where it says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. Your mind needs some water in it. Your water, some water to run through it and flush out our carnal thinking, our own ways, religious things that are not of God, and our mind needs to be replaced with the truth. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. You won't change into a butterfly unless you allow God to change the way you think about your strength, about your time, about your money, about your friends, about the world, all these things. Change takes place in the mind. Be ye renewed, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Thank you for staying with me. Just one more thing as we prepare for this <clears throat> significant close to this meeting. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's how it ends. And the word prove me means to discern or to know. All of this that I've been saying, it comes to this climax. Changed, transformed, renewed, so that you may know what God's will for your life is. so that you can begin to know why you were born. Why God has given you life. Why he has sustained you to this day that you haven't been the victim of an automobile accident. A heart attack hasn't taken you. God saved me from a fatal heart attack because there was a little bit, mo bit more of his will that needed to be done. We live to do the will of God. The highest thing you can do is to do the will of God. Jesus, we're going to get something to eat. Shall we bring you something? No. He says, my meat is to 
Do the will of him that sent me. That's what I'm absorbed in. I delight to do thy will of God. One more scripture, please turn with me, in Colossians. To Colossians. If you're still with me, I appreciate you still being with me. And with this we close and David has a song for us to get enter into. Oh, praise the Lord. Watch this. Listen how powerful this is. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. I wish we had a, an hour to preach on this one. <laughs> Glory to God. <clears throat> Listen now. By the way, this is God's holy word. Colossians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire. Here's a prayer and a desire. That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Filled. No doubts. No mixture. Filled with the knowledge of his will. What would God have you to do? day by day by day, and in a lifetime. God can show it to you. Filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom, that's the ways of God, and spiritual understanding or comprehension. Lord, I want to understand your will for my life. That's Paul's desire that you might walk worthy, and I'm going to put my own translation in here, which comes from others, that you might walk worthy of the Lord in every way. Pleasing him in all things is the real meaning there. Pleasing him in all things. And also being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That you may know <clears throat> the good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God. Why? So that you can walk in it. So that you can walk in the light of his will. I trust the Lord will not only bless this exposition of Romans 12, 1 and 2, <clears throat> but I pray for an impact on your life that this message today will be life-changing. <clears throat> that you will you will find a response in your heart as David comes. <clears throat> that you will find a response in your heart and you will say, yes, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I come to your altar today. And there are those who need to come to the literal altar today. This is your day. I didn't know about you, but the Lord definitely gave me this word, <clears throat> a challenge to present our bodies, all that we are, to him and say, here I am, Lord. I want to be yours I want to be changed. I want to know your will. <clears throat> yes. As the word was going forth, it's really this word today really really hit my heart. And it's God since at least the fellowship this year.
We open up the meeting today by singing, This is Holy Ground. And uh, this is an awesome holy moment. Please acknowledge God in all that has transpired and all that you have heard this morning. This could be the life-changing moment that God has for you. A moment that will change the course of all the rest of your life. Think of it. And if you, I, I, I just want to ask you to obey the Spirit of God. If you have any nudging at all, any stirring at all in your heart, that this time has been for you, for you to make that change that you know you needed, I'm going to ask you to come up to this altar, to, make, to come up to a literal altar to transact something in your heart with the Lord. And what, I'm, what I feel the Holy Spirit is asking you to do is to repent of all your own ways that you've taken in the past that have messed up your life. Be honest. If your life is messed up today, it's because you have made the wrong choices and you have ignored the ways of the Lord. And it may be in different degrees for different people. Some, you know, hey, you know, I just, oh, my life's been a total wreck because of all the choices I made. Others of you need to make some adjustments of some of your ways. And so come asking the Lord to give you forgiveness of your past ways and asking the Lord to accept the dedication and the presentation that you are making today. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Come with the deep, earnest desire that, oh, from now on, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to seek his will. I'm going to get into that word. And I'll tell you, God will help you. His grace will be there if you make that step. So as we sing, be honest. If you feel the, the need to come and come up here, do it. Don't disobey the Lord. Don't disobey his Holy Spirit. Because there's a reason why I've read Romans 12, 1 and 2 a hundred times in my life. But oh, when I read it this week, the Lord stopped me with every word. Stop me, stop me, stop me. He said, oh, here, this is a message that you need to give. All right, let's sing it and obey the Lord. Lord, my heart longs to be your dwelling place, a home for the presence of the Lord. So Hallelujah. let my life, so let my life now be. That I may be what I was born to be.
that my life now be separated.